Okay, welcome everybody. Good evening. As part of uh, Black History Month, we're holding this event at the University of Aberdeen to celebrate the achievements of Black people around the world, both historically and in the present time. We're delighted to welcome Professor Chris Jackson, who's a professor of Basin Analysis in the Department of Earth Science and Engineering at Imperial College London, and we hope to have a conversation with him over the next hour. For many, and I suspect there'll be plenty in the audience for whom Chris needs no introduction whatsoever. He's an accomplished scientist who's received many awards through his career so far, and is no stranger to the media limelight. This year, he'll be the first black scientist to present a Royal Institute Christmas lecture. Chris has a very long CV, so I'm trying to condense that in a very short um, period of time. He completed a BSc and a PhD in geology at Manchester University, and after a stint in Bergen in Norway, returned to the UK to take up a full-time academic position at Imperial College. I can see that this didn't, in any shape or form, diminish his enthusiasm for adventure because his geological fieldwork seems to take him to remote and challenging locations around the world, including the Argentinian Andes, the Borneo rainforest, and the Sinai Desert. Chris has also appeared in a number of exciting television programs, such as Expedition Volcano, which understands a BBC Two series about an expedition to two of the world's most spectacular, but least well-known active volcanoes, on the border between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda. And he's got several other earth science focused documentaries to his name. Apart from work, as you probably have guessed, Chris has a very active lifestyle and he's confirmed that he's completed nine marathons and I understand more than 30 half marathons and a couple of triathlons. He's also a keen rock climber and hiker. So in, in short, he's like everybody's idea of the perfect academic who combines academic excellence with, <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like the way you're laughing at it, with a very full life. <laughs> so welcome, Chris, and over the next 30 minutes, I'm hoping to have a discussion with you about some aspects of your life and work so far. But before we get into that, some general rules for, for this audience, which is each of you will notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A option for you to submit questions. Hopefully, we'll be able to take questions for the last 20 minutes or so of the hour. If there's anything you'd like to ask, please submit your questions and we'll pick it up. So welcome again, Chris. Hi. Hello, Batty. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the invitation and the and the lovely introduction. Whenever, whenever people read out introductions like that, I always, I always feel slightly disappointed. It's actually going to be me who, who appears to talk to people. <laughs> you, you, you are not a disappointment in any shape <laughs> or form. But, but let me start with a se serious question. C can you tell us about your experience of growing up and how you became interested in science and in actually becoming a scientist? Yeah, so um, I was a very active kid, which probably comes as no surprise to uh, people having heard what you just read out. So I spent most of my time running around, playing football, doing athletics, and generally not avoiding schoolwork, but certainly um, doing it in, in, with sufficient depth of interest that I could still fulfil my interests outside of school, shall we say. So I was very, very active. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of worked hard. My parents are uh, from the Caribbean. My mum was from Jamaica. My dad's from St. Vincent. And they emphasised the importance of working hard. So it wasn't necessarily that they placed a high premium on achievement in academia. It was more that you just applied yourself, you know, uh, at school. Um, so funnily enough, um, my lowest GCSE grade was in science. So I wasn't actually a very, and still probably not, a very good scientist. And it was actually one of the things I found hardest because I found it a little bit abstract, actually. Um, and I, I, I guess even now I like to see kind of maths and physics and chemistry applied to specific problems. And maybe at the time, the way those 
disciplines were taught were a bit more abstract for my for my mind. So I think to answer your question, I guess I kind of stumbled into it. I didn't have this like burning passion for geology. I didn't have this talent at all for science as demonstrated by my grades. Um, but I did spend a lot of time outdoors. You know, I did spend, I'm from Derbyshire, I spent a lot of time in the Peak District. You know, my parents were avid caravanners and campers. So we spent a lot of time out there amongst the, the rocks in the, in, in, in the wild. And uh, so maybe through those experiences of being outside and being surrounded by like this phenomenal natural landscape, um, it kind of soaked into me, but I guess I was never really aware of that as a potential kind of career at all. It wasn't until um, I was doing my A-levels and I kind of stumbled into the tertiary college where I did it and I was gonna do maths, physics and geography. And I saw this table which had like volcanoes and dinosaurs on. And I thought, oh, that looks much more interesting than, than this, kind of, um, this kind of table which had a bunch of equations on it. Uh, and so that just drew me in. And, and I think ever since then, I've just really enjoyed geoscience and I won't, I'm not embarrassed to say it's one of the things I found easiest. And I always say this to people. People say, why do you become a geologist? And I say, because I was rubbish at lots of other things. You know, and that's true, I think, for a lot of academics is there's lots of things we can't do. And there's, there's vanishingly few things we can do. And that maybe applies to the public at large. It just so happens that it's geosciences. So I, yeah, that's how I led into it. But my parents were great through all of that. They had no idea what geosciences was. They just let me find my own path, really. That, that's, that, that, that sounds great, but to what extent did race affect your experience of choosing science as a career? And what is your current experience as a black man, an athletic, and a very visible leader within the scientific community? Yeah, so um, honestly, I don't think race has ever... Well, let me qualify that. I've, I've, I've had racist incidents that have, which have been hurtful. I don't feel race has held me back. And the reason I sometimes say that, or at least the, the reason it's possible to say that is because if you look at my CV you just read out, a lot of people would look at that and go, well, Chris, you know, there's absolutely no way in which he could have experienced racism or there's no way in which his career or his enjoyment of life has been held back because of racism. And you know, to some measure that might be true, but I'm telling you now that I have experienced things. There's also lots of racism which goes on which I don't know about when I'm not in the room and decisions that are made because I'm black or decisions that are not made in my favor because I'm black. And those things could have, you know, could have impeded my progress um, and, I, and I wouldn't be aware of that. So, um, I have, yeah, so I have, I have experienced, I have experienced sort of barriers, but I think this is a really important point for the audience to take away. You know, you're talking to one black person at this event and, and black people have myriad experiences and have, and have very, very different personalities. We are not a homogenous group. I'm pretty thick skinned. I'm pretty tenacious. My parents were very kind of confident people. They were very encouraging. And so when I probably faced some barriers that have either been really obvious to me or maybe a bit more subtle, I, I felt compelled because of my character to take them on. And it may be not the most appropriate way at times in a kind of, you know, I get upset and I, you know, I, I feel there's a, a wrong and it needs to be righted. But that's not true for all black people. And obviously those racist experiences that I felt could have just completely derailed the career of somebody who wasn't like me. So they're not so they're not appropriate, right? It does, it's not like oh, I can do this because Chris can handle this. It, these 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 activities and these behaviours are, are completely inappropriate. So yes, yeah, so I've got to where I am now, and I've you know I'm trying to make the case that we need to hear a plethora of black people really to get a view as to you know what the experiences of black people are. Um, and now I think, you know, like weirdly enough, most of the racist experiences I've had have been more recently in my life where you amass a CV like you just read out and you think with that education, you've kind of educated yourself out of racism, right? You've educated your way out of a place where people could say, oh, this black guy is a kind of physical threat or this black guy is stupid or this black guy shouldn't be in this space, but it still happens to me and it's, and it's happened recently. Um, and it just shows you that, you know, how deep rooted those things are. And yes, I just, you know, I'm, 
being the person I am, I call it out. I confidently go up against that and kind of try and educate people why their assumption that I am the cleaner or I am the PhD student or I'm simply here to come and fix the air conditioning unit. You know, I try, I can, I can sort of see where those biases are coming from. And I give them a bit of an opportunity to learn from why that's, you know, it's an inappropriate behavior to, 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 to bring on somebody. Um, but yeah, but, but you're right with, with, with increasing amounts of visibility and, you know, thinking about the Christmas lectures, you, you can become a bit of a, a target for, for racist remarks. I can live with that because I know those people are not cross with me. They're not angry with me as with Chris Jackson. They're just angry with this caricature of a black person who they think has stolen an opportunity from a, a more well-deserving non-black person, right? And, 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 you know, I think that's just something I'm gonna have to cope with and, and handle. And I'm, and I think it's, I, I think it's a good use of my position and platform is to, draw some of that fire and to talk about those experiences. You, you've talked about confidence and you've talked about the, you, obviously your, your own um, resilience and your ability to call things out, but you've also mentioned that there are other people with, with, with stories about um, their experience of racism in academia. What, what do you feel about the current academic landscape and racism within it and how does it affect people do you think yeah you hear you hear very heartbreaking stories and i would i would again admit here that i've only become really aware of those probably in the last five to ten years of my growing up right and and so maybe through half of my time at um at uh, at imperial um so yeah so how, how do they manifest and how do they stop people progressing? What, what kind of always confuses me about this is academia is kind of a liberal, left-leaning bunch of people, right? And yet we have a culture which means we have these exclusionary behaviours, not just towards black people, but also towards other marginalised groups. So why is that? You know, we've got people who, in terms of their voting intentions or whatever, you know, they, they, they probably vote in the, in the broader social interest. And I, I'm thinking on my feet here, I, I wonder if it's to do with the academic environment and culture. It's, it's a very individualistic culture in that sense, in that achievement will be attained in a certain way. And institutional greatness and where it sits in, let's say, the league tables or how it does in ref, all comes down to individual attainment and in the academic sphere. And so there's, 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 there's very little motivation to, 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 to bring your politics from home and your liberalism into being non-exclusionary at work and, 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 and thinking about why have we never had a black lecturer at the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures for 185 years? And why do we have a, a dearth of um, women, let's say, in leadership positions at, at universities, and, 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 and having that critical thought, which is bizarre, right? Because academics are built around solving hard problems. <laughs> like, that's, that's what we're trained to do, is we're built to, we're bi not, only we tr not only we trained to, to solve hard problems, we actually go and look for them, right? We go and look for hard problems to try and fix. And here is, a, here is an issue in academia to do with discrimination, race-based discrimination. And we're still like scratching our chins and having kind of, you know, in some ways Black History Month events, or we're having like podcasts and we're kind of like going, how can we further this conversation? And I think we all know in our heart of hearts how to do it. For the most part, I just think there's, there's some resistance to that because maybe some people think oh but there's this bigger thing at risk which is like academic excellence quote unquote if we let all these you know people in i mean you, you've clearly kind of thought about it and you mentioned this ability to question oneself and and academics are meant to do that and do do it so that's the dialectic bit and they're also very liberal in the outlook and they're global citizens. And we were talking before we came live on, 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 uh, on the screens about the furious amount of travel that many academics do. What do you think they're missing? Is it the ability to see the world through other people's eyes? Is that the vital bit that's missing? 
I think I think you're I think you're yeah yeah and this year 2020 in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and everything that's happened I've had conversations with people who are again quote unquote good people because there's this classic question isn't there can good people be racist right with good people who you know will you know vote a certain way they'll give money to charity they they won't you know shout at people and call them names in the street and yet when you know let's take statues for example you know th this discussion about statues comes up they suddenly are like oh but you know this is part of my history and we can't erase history and i can see all upsets and cross about this racist slave owner in the entrance hall of the building in which you work but but if we if we take that away what what where does it end and and what they don't understand in that exchange is that that is a you know what we call a microaggression and in fact it possibly goes beyond that actually um and I think, yeah, I think I think that so that is one thing that's kind of shocked me is is some people who've probably thought very hard about the world, uh, that in, in the way you're saying, you know, they've thought hard about the world in one way, but they've not really thought about it probably in as broad a way as they should have, or at least not with respect to to racism and specifically to do with anti-black racism in the UK. They they possibly have a better idea about racism in the US because they have in their mind segregation. They may have a better idea about racism in South Africa because of apartheid. They may have a, you know, they may have a better idea of racism outside of their, their building, in their own building. And yet actually trying to recognize, um, because this Black History Month is not just about Black British, of course, it's just, you know, the thing I'm most familiar with. Um, but the, the kind of, the, the, the challenges of being black British in their own building are, 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 are more alien to them than any other form of racism. And um, that's hard, you know, because it's a difficult conversation to have because as soon as you highlight the fact that that comment is problematic or that view needs, you know, people get, people think it's a, it's a personal attack. They, they think you're painting them as a bad person. They think you, you're out to get them you know there's this trope of the aggressive angry black person so oh here we go you know now we can see their true colors because they get really cross and and it's none of those things of course and in fact they should be thanking us for, for talking to them about these things and spending our time trying to educate people because there's a lot of black people who rightly cannot be bothered to do that because they're too busy trying to eat and sleep and cope with life and not spend their time talking to non-black people about racism, yeah. What do you say to people that um, who say we don't see color, we don't see race, we treat everybody equally? <laughs> yeah, can, does does my laugh serve as an answer? I, I should I should be a bit more constructive than just laughing. the The reason that's yeah, the reason that's a problematic view is because you need to be able to see people's individual experiences and people's individual individuality if you want to contextualize like how, you know, how they are, how you act towards them, the things that they not need, because it makes it sound like a dependency relationship and it's not that, but it, it makes you more aware of the, spe the specificities of the challenges and, and, you, and your role in trying to tackle those if you're in the majority group, right? If you're in the majority group holding power, especially you should be seeing color and you should be seeing you know, the physical abilities of people, or if people are neurodiverse, you should be seeing all of those things. Um, because if you don't, and which is why I laugh, if you don't, you, you basically assume everybody is, should be treated equally, and everybody's had the same access to opportunity, up to the point at which you're going to, let's say, judge their job application, or ju judge their, you know, whether you're going to give them an opportunity of some sort. Um, so that's the problem is if you if you are kind of colorblind, you, you lack that context, I think. I mean, if you think about it, and we're talking about the higher education sector, I mean, we've already had had um, quite strong um, guidance from Advance HE and the document on tackling racial inequalities in higher education. So in a sense, that information is already out there. Why do you think people are very defensive of um, the concept of structural racism within a sector? Well, because it goes back to my point just now, I think, doesn't it? I think 
because people think it's it's yeah um, yeah people think it's you calling it's, people think it's us calling them racist right and and that's a hugely upsetting term isn't it if somebody says you're racist you're a misogynist or you're a, you know you're a homophobe or like they're really hurtful words because you obviously think of yourself as being a good person and yet somebody's saying you're complicit in a system you're actively working you're either passively complicit in the system or you're actively working in an exclusionary way within that system to keep these people at the margins and and, and not afford them the opportunities they actually deserve and that and nobody wants to hear that um so why do people respond like that um yeah i think it's i think it's I think there's one thing is they just don't like to hear it. Some people are just racist and they need to be told it and they need to change. And, and I'm sorry, there's no real easy way to sugarcoat that message. I think the other issue we have, and, and I'd be interested to take your view on this, is institutions like the universities are very big, complex organizations, very hierarchical, lots of people, and there's lots of processes which are sort of notionally designed by people which then another bunch of people sort of implement. So there's, you know, there's some people who design processes for better practice, there's some people who implement those. And, and the actual responsibility for the harm that is brought upon minority groups, say let's say black people, by a, you know, um, you know some hiring criteria, which is discriminatory, let's say, because that's one thing we were working on with the Race Equality Charter yesterday. Um, and we look at hiring criteria, um, nobody almost has responsibility for that right no, like everybody's looking at each other and trying to work out why it's there but it's always been there we've always done it this way but if we want to change it it takes a lot of time and you know we need to go through these various subcommittees but like you say events advanced he and places like that and you can pretty much google racism in academia and you'll find out it's a problem <laughs> you don't need you, you don't need all these things to kind of be provoked into action. And that I think is one of the things I find most painful. And I often refer to universities almost as like zombie-like entities where they just have all these people in them and they have all these processes and the, the university quote unquote, the institution just wanders around with all these problems and, and nobody seems to be able to tackle it. And I guess I'm feeling incredibly grumpy at the moment because I think the people in senior leadership positions who get paid the money to make the hard decisions have that power to do that and you know it's literally at the flick of a switch they could do that and I think it's simply a case of doing the right thing at the right time and making a hard decision but the appetite for that sometimes doesn't seem to be there and 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 it goes back again to something we were talking about before we started is I think that happens because the right people aren't in the room. And I, and I think this is this issue with why do we need diverse leadership? Why do we just need diverse body of people in universities anyway? But why do we need diverse leadership in universities at the, at the senior levels? Is because of those experiences will make us make harder decisions and also make better decisions, I think. So I think you've talked about the, the, the normative being the normative and, and which is why it almost seems to, from what you say, take an extraordinary amount of effort to shift that position. We're talking in the context of Black History Month. What does it mean to you? And we've accepted that symbols do matter. So how can something like this act as a force for positive change? Yeah, so I think something like Black History Month is good. I think it allows you to, you know, as institutions or individuals to dig around and maybe bring forth the stories of these lost people, these, these lost black people. Um, we're talking about academia here, but, you know, just the contributions of black people just globally in any sector. So it allows us to talk, you know, about those people. It allows us to celebrate, you know, black people who are presently um, doing great things. It also makes us look to the future as well about what processes and how we can change society to be better and so that you know anti-black racism is not doesn't persist into the future. I, I think one thing that makes me hesitate about Black History Month is a couple of things. One is it's kind of like taking the pulse once a year on, on an otherwise dead corpse. I don't I guess you can't have an a live corpse, so a corpse. <laughs> 
<laughs> you work in medicine, right? You don't need a dead corpse. I kind of, I had an extra word in there, didn't I? Didn't <laughs> no, but it illustrated the picture you're trying to paint perfectly. <laughs> so it's like taking the course of a corpse um, once a year when what you need to really be doing is some kind of longer term sort of resuscitate, you know, kind of activities between the Octobers. We need to be doing things and, and it can, Black History Month can serve as a bit of a sticking plaster for myriad problems because it's like a way of, uh, of people saying, well, look, you know, we've, we've, we celebrate, but you know, it's like George Floyd, loads of people are marching, getting really cross and buying t-shirts and then suddenly it stopped. And then suddenly it's like, oh God, we're still talking about black people. I thought racism was fixed when I blacked out my Instagram. Like, oh, it's, oh, there's still discrimination. I'm really surprised. And, and, you know, we need to have things which are more sustained and we need, we need Black History Month if it's going to be relevant to be the thing which maybe catalyzes activities at that point in the year, which then we come back a year later to, a, to look at again to see if we've made good on those promises. The other thing about Black History Month that slightly concerns me and a lot of the narratives around Black history can relate to excellence. You know, the only Black people we, we, we dredge up from Wikipedia <laughs> or the only black people we call up to come and do some like podcast or something are the ones who are doing like who are, who are having to uber achieve in a very you know white defined sort of set of metrics about what we consider excellence and achievements and we, we, we and and you, you kind of have to be superhuman to be given an opportunity to speak and, and an opportunity to be recognized for the contribution you made and I, I'm really, really keen on dismantling that idea. And, and why? Because I think there's lots of mediocre white people <laughs> in positions. And so to, to try and put upon black people that they need to be exceptional to achieve. And there's lots of studies, isn't there, around this saying how many more grant applications black people have to put in before they get funded the same amount. And, you know, and, and how many job applications they have to put in before you know somebody will you know give them an interview and there's lots of things which say you already have to be exceptional and black history month could could, could serve usefully to to shift that narrative away and talk less about the individuals perhaps which are important in the role model sense i agree but more just around the, the broader contributions well not even the broader contributions of black people because otherwise you get in this messy space where you only value black people because they brought something to the economy. You know, there's all there's all these curiosities which David Olsega talks about where, you know, black people are monetized, so we should value them because they're worth something. And that's that's like really crap. Like it shouldn't you know you shouldn't be doing that. You should just be talking about them. So, so I think if, if I if I understood you correctly, I think what, what you're suggesting is A not look backwards all the time but look to the future and not just celebrate uber achievement but celebrate a body of achievement by people who have worth in themselves yeah exactly because otherwise we end up just talking about slavery every black history month right and it's like you could like that's really important and it's very formative and and it's and it is and it's crucial to be aware of that because it sets the context for some of the socio-economic issues black people face in the country now you know that like why, you know, why is there lots of knife crime in London? Well, it's not because black people like knives and stabbing each other and they're really violent. It's because there are these deep rooted socioeconomic problems, which are a long, long hangover of racism. And, and but, you know, and so, so, so knitting that together for people in Black History Month by talking about why that occurs is useful. But equally, I think like looking to the future and looking at how we can make real policy change um, is useful because what we really want to do is not just make life better for the people, the black people now, you know, we want to try and make it better for, for black people in the future. So that the, going back to your point, uh, Batty, about the, the structural bit of the systems we work in, the structural racism, we need to go for that because I think the, I think just squabbling and scrapping with individuals like I sometimes do is, is, is not the best use of energies. I think we need to go for the bigger, the bigger system, systemic sort of issues we have, um, which undoubtedly means fighting with some individuals who hold the reins of power at those levels. But that is where I want to spend some of my time and energy, and I encourage others to do so. Thanks, Chris. And that, I think that's a great uh, moment to go to some of the, the questions because we've accumulated quite a few while, while we've been talking. 
So um, they're going to be coming at from various perspectives. So there's not a clear thread through them all, but bear with us. So the first question is from Vic Victoria. What gets you up in the morning and keeps you driven? Any tips for someone looking to get into the academic field? Um, oh my goodness. My kids normally get me up in the morning. <laughs> um, I think there's a couple of things, you know, like I guess you can go into work every day not so much in COVID times because everybody sort of knows what they're getting into when they're going to work now because it's a bit grim, but it's one of those jobs where you can go in and every day is kind of going to be different. And whether it's a bit of science you're working on where you're going to see a new piece of data um, or you're going to suddenly solve a problem that you've been thinking about for a long time, you know, there is that, that kind of excitement of seeing something for the first time, which is why I desperately cling to research days, even though I've you know, become more senior, I desperately cling to looking at data and spending time with the second thing which I really value is the people. You know, the, the people you work with and, and specifically and um, the students and postdocs, you know, and, and seeing and, and recognizing that as an academic, it's an incredible privilege to be entrusted with the education of somebody else. And that could be either an undergraduate or a PhD student, or even, I guess, postdoc, technically you, you had it and even PhDs, you're guiding them through their own learning experience. But that's a huge privilege and a huge honor. And getting time to spend with them and seeing the excitement and seeing the challenges and working together to solve those things. I think that's really worth getting out of bed for in the morning in terms of work, yeah. Okay, moving swiftly on to the next question from Nijme. I'm a PhD student and I'd like to know what measures I can take now and moving forward in my academic career to support and promote the voices of my POC peers. Yeah, POC, so people of colour peers. Um, yeah, I, this is a great question. And this is a question I think, yeah, I love this question because what it says is, even though I'm sort of still moving through this academic experience, I want to be equipping myself now with the ability to, to raise up other people. <laughs> like, that's a kind of rare, that's a rare desire and it's a rare skill. And um, we need more people like that. So I think one thing is, you know, just getting engaged with discussions around um, diversity, equality, diversity and inclusion at the university or the, the institution you're based at, being aware of the, the diversity or not in that institution. Um, any um, things which can help increase diversity would be useful. So um, outreach and engagement and going to communities who historically have been marginalized. I think that need not necessarily be just black community or, you know, let's say the, let's use the term the BAME community or like any sort of specific racial and ethnic group. You could just go and work in schools where, which are based in areas of uh, financial hardship or for, you know, financially underprivileged areas because because of this intersectional issue that poverty is also common to being black and common to being in a racial and ethnic group, you will by that outreach and engagement activity, you will, you will, you will touch and, and can possibly inspire a lot of people. Um, so I think that's an important thing to do is to, is to kind of get educated and then to get engaged in things that can help drive change. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is slightly different. Um, Oxbridge have application fees for PhD applications. Oh, God. <laughs> Do you think this has an effect on economic and ethnic diversity in their courses? Yeah, of course it does. <laughs> I mean, they, they, yeah, there's a bunch of data. In fact, I was looking at some data today around this because as some of you probably know, Imperial College, within their wisdom, have decided to introduce an £80 application fee for MSc and MRes applicants. Bearing in mind there's seven applicants for each position, six people are literally giving their money away for the privilege of applying for something they then don't get. Um, so yes, of course, because it, it you know, that, fin that, that financial demand places a barrier in front of people who are financially underprivileged and those people who are financially underprivileged are likely to span a range of racial and ethnic groups, including white people, right? So it's gonna span a range of groups and therefore it's gonna impact all of those groups in a negative way. And, you know, you can, 
it's, it's just so annoying because presumably 20 years ago, people are scratching their heads and working out why have we not got much diversity in universities and people are introducing fees and they're thinking in 20 years time, I wonder why we don't have more diverse student and staff body at universities. It's probably because you have things like this in the way and and monitoring it is important, right? Because that's the argument that's come back to me at times is, oh, but you know, how do you know it's going to affect it? Well, unless you have baseline data around winding participation, like what is the body of applicants you're getting now before the fee and what's the body of applicants look like now after you've introduced the fee, you have no way of assessing the impact. And it is a fair assumption, given the informal feedback from applicants, is that they see it as a barrier. So yeah, absolutely. Things any anything where you start asking people for money up front is gonna is gonna is gonna stop the least wealthy people applying. Sure, thanks. Coming to the next question, what do you think university committees can practically and proactively do to improve representation of people of colour, women, etc.? Yeah, I mean my my headline answer to that is just get rid of all committees and actually do something right i think i just, i'm just i'm just maybe again i'm just grumpy what is it? it's the last day of october right it's the end of black history month and i've done i've talked to a lot of people about things and you know people love committees and subcommittees and sub subcommittees because it makes it look like they're doing something and it helps them develop action plans that get made into a pdf and put in a hard drive somewhere and it's all very inspiring of course but it's but what we need is actually some changes. We need we need we need we need those action plans to be to be actioned. And so, what do I mean by that? So you know, we we can think about when we're trying to um, hire people, right? So when we're working with um, companies who might be looking for senior leadership or you know recruitment companies, we should be engaging with them and saying, look, these are our stated values around EDI, equality, diversity, and inclusion we want you to work really hard on getting us a very diverse candidate list. And we don't care if that takes longer than it normally would. We're not gonna rush this because we actually want to do this the best possible way. I think as well, we need to be more proactive in institutions at, um, at firstly identifying incidents of race-based discrimination, which have materially held back and mentally hurt people of color, uh, so black people. So having, have, having reporting systems, which allow anonymous reporting, but have teeth. So if somebody reports something, there is a, um, a real punishment and a public statement about that, because otherwise you end up in a situation where black people are already feeling kind of exposed in, and having little power in these systems. They're not gonna report because they feel that if they report something, they're gonna be victimized further. And we want to we want people to report things, and then if somebody is found guilty of a transgression, then that needs to be reported back so that the broader black community around that individual who reported it actually knows that if something happens and they report it, it's likely to be acted upon. And also, it sends a signal to, you know, the other people in that institution that that behaviour will not be tolerated. Um, so things like non-disclosure agreements are problematic. Things like, you know, anonymity around some human resource um, procedures are problematic for these respects. It goes all the way through to sexual harassment is a very good example of this, where the reporting, you know, is, is, is not as much as it should be because people feel exposed in, in, in that reporting stage. So I think, yeah. You know, there's there's a huge load of things that are in the advanced HE charter, right? And there's loads of things in the race equality charter to go and look at that we can do, but we need to be doing them. Oh. You'll be relieved to know that the next bit isn't a question. It's uh, it's a compliment to say, just wanted to give my thanks for such an insightful conversation. Chris fantastically articulated many of the challenges we face as an academic community. Well, thank I've you. Learned. Thank you very much. <laughs> And now we come to a question. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's value in Athena Swan or Race Equality Charter? We have the Equality Act 2010. Shouldn't we be checking organizations against this in relation to being fit for anti-racist purpose? Why are we adding other processes? Oh, that's a great question. And it's a very complicated one. And it's very, very topical, given that um 
some people on the call may or may not know, but some of the funding bodies in the UK have recently sort of removed that or, or weakened that, shall we say. They've, they've removed it almost as a requirement for funding. So there was, a, there was a movement towards the fact that you needed to have some sort of minimum standards around the race quality charter mark and around Athena Swan if you were to be eligible for certain funding. Um, and that sort of had its teeth removed a little bit now. How do I feel about that? I personally think that things like the race quality chart mark, Athena Swan, what they do do is they, they, they allow you to look at how terrible things they are. They allow you to get data together. They allow you to, to kind of quantify the scale of the problem. What I don't then care about is whether you get a certificate to put up at the entrance hall to your building. I think the act of that kind of navel gauging and, and self-awareness and, 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 and self-analysis is useful in itself. Um, my, my concern though, having said that, if now that we're starting to remove those things as a requirement, universities will back away from trying to do anything around gender equality or anything around race equality. You know, they'll, they'll see it as, oh, we no longer have to do this. And if they do, then clearly, clearly those things would have been tick box exercises, right? The only reason we're gonna do this is so we get the certificate so we can try and win this, this big grant. So I, I, yeah, where do I sit on it overall? I think on balance, I think they're valuable. Yeah, I think they're valuable. Yeah, I think, and I think we should have them. I just want something to happen when we've done the analysis. <laughs> okay, fair, fair, fair enough. Uh, I forgot to mention the previous comments, compliment was from Neil, and this question that you've just answered is from Musharat. We now have a question from Marion who wants to know, should university race policies and learning also include local areas of concern rather than always concentrating on national movements? Example, um, at a recent equality, diversity, inclusion meeting, a committee member advised that hate crime stats for our local area highlighted that the two groups that were at the top of the list were Asian and Eastern European. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Okay. So the question is, so the question is whether... If it isn't a local problem, is it still a problem? Um, yeah, it is, because a university serves not just its local environment, it serves the global society, right? So it has a civic duty to the local population to the, and to the, 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 the state it finds itself in, but also we're trying to solve global problems. Our our research need not only solve the problem of Eastern European <laughs> criminality on the block next to where the university is, it can talk more about why criminality arises anyway. And it's probably not because people are Eastern European, it's probably because of some so underlying socioeconomic issue, of course. So, um, yeah, I think, I think we should span all of those things, is my, is my answer. Great, and I'm, I'm just conscious we've got 15 minutes and quite a lot of questions still to get through. So we are racing along now. The next question is from Costas, who asks, do you think race-based discrimination is a constitutive element of capitalism? Do you think racist behavior is a manifestation of fear of losing the privileges that have been established by white majorities over racial ethnic minorities? Wow. wow. So, you know, when I when, I, when I'm in these like Q and A's, I kind of think, oh, there was one time when I used to kind of go and look at rocks in the mountains and try and work out where the rocks came from. And now I find myself answering questions about capitalism and racism, which kind of is slightly depressing, of course, because it says something about the fact that academia needs these questions to be answered. So to your question, um, yeah, I think, I think the, you know, I, I don't really want to kind of delve around the capitalism bit, but I think it does relate to the latter bit of your question, which is, is racism a manifestation of people trying to protect their that what they have then yes of course yeah i mean people and and whether they draw the line at, at, at race or whether they draw the line at ethnicity or you know let's think about white people and you know the, the concerns of like eastern and central european people move you know the immigration into the uk that's kind of not because they're black it's because they're they're typically from a different ethnic group so there's a line drawn there between those two people um, we can look at it in terms of uh, wealth um, and, and financial privilege. You know, the, the certain class groups will try and carve out other class groups as well and, and, and suppress them so that they can keep enjoying the, 
financial privilege they have. So yes, absolutely. And, the, and that's not to give it a, a pass. That's not to apologize to these people, but that's possibly one reason it arises, yeah. Okay, the next question is from Ashish, who wants to know, how do we challenge the idea of meritocracy in academia? As a person of color, it's depressing to see far lower opportunities and rates of success. Makes me question the idea of excellence. Is there a different yardstick? Yeah, <laughs> this is another one of my, uh, this is one of my hobby horses, is the, uh, the notion of excellence. Like, and, 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 and the notion of excellence being founded on a meritocratic framework. Frameworks aren't meritocratic if they're not designed by everybody. There's a, there's a bit of news for you. Um, a meritocratic frameworks, and they are very long lived. That's one of the things in academia. These are very long lived indicators of excellence, quote unquote, or indicators of achievement are based around things which, you know, a relatively small demographic, I'll, I'll, I'll state it like that, and you can guess who I'm talking about, a relatively narrow demographic who decided this is what makes a good scientist, and lo and behold, it probably fits what they've achieved, and then that propagates through. So even as we have increasing number of diversity in academia, the things people are being measured by in that meritocratic framework are not designed for the broader suite of things academia now has to do, and the broader suite of things we are we are we are kind of um, required to undertake as, as as academics. So what do I mean by that? Well, you know, all this angst about teaching numbers and online learning. We need brilliant educators. We need people who are technology savvy. We need people who, you know, and 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 these have historically not been things which have been valued in the same way as writing a paper for Nature or or, or getting half a million pounds of grant money in. But 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 financially now people who are great educators or you know they they are they are very central probably to the going to be very central to the financial health of, of, of the institutions they find themselves in and just more generally um so yeah i i i, I and I, and you know and then there's this other you know moan i can have about the fact that a lot of the metrics that underpin those meritocratic frameworks are just statistically nonsense general impact factors h indexes you know you, you can look at the self citation rates and how they fall across different demographics, how they fall between, you know, across different genders. And they do serve one narrow demographic much better than the rest of us. And so therefore it's not an equitable, I don't think the meritocratic framework is an equitable framework within which to assess researchers presently. Great, thank you. The next question is from Anonymous. What is one thing we could all do in academia and other careers to be more inclusive in our activities? <laughs> um, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, it's, well, you've attended this event, right? I think that's, I think, I think that shows a, a desire to, and hopefully in something I've said in the last 40 minutes has been sort of vaguely useful for you. Um, and you can go and read books and you can watch films. And I think, I think all of those things are very passive ingesting of insights into, into race, into race-based discrimination, into racism. You, you, you learn a lot from those things. If you want to action those things, I think that takes more effort. And I think, you know, just small things that we've been doing this summer in our group is talk, you know, like reading papers about um, racial bias in publishing and reading papers around um, the lack of racial kind of integration in research projects. So, you know, what do you call it? Parachute science. So this idea that a bunch of white people just arrive in this country, do a bit of science, cut out the local population who they're notionally there to serve all the academics already there and then leave. Um, so making yourself aware of that and trying to, you know, educate the next generation about these issues. Um, think about things like you know, there's loads and loads of things, but like think about things like job adverts that you're writing. You know, when, when you get your shortlists up for a job or a PhD studentship, look at that. Before you write the advert, put the language through a gendered language checker because they will also pick up words which can actually, you know, put off certain um, racial and ethnic minorities as well. So you need to check at every step that you are really, really trying to check your unconscious biases. And I think even that willingness to kind of just pause, look at the list, 
you know, and then and then reassess maybe is, is a good thing to do. I, I talk about this to a friend of mine, you know, in Norway here a lot. Doing the right thing takes longer than doing the wrong thing. If you want to do the right thing, it takes more time and effort. And you just need to decide whether you think that's worthwhile. And, and, and if you don't, and there's still racial, dis, you know, exclusionary behaviours that happen as a function of what you do, I think you have to live with that. It's terrible, but you know, maybe maybe you've not kind of had enough time to do the best thing you could do. Thank you. A question from Waro who asks, have you ever thought of academic racism as due to the system tactically not recognizing and celebrating innovative research um, by black students and staff, and also the media not celebrating black innovations, but uh, mentioning black problems? Yeah, I think so. I think the media's got everything to do with it. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, hidden figures to, to kind of take the name of the, the book and film. You know, there's lots of um, people historically and you know, presently are not in the limelight and are not being afforded the opportunity or haven't and are not being afforded the opportunities they should have. So, you know, this question came up to me around the, um, the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures as being the first black person in 185 years. And the question was put to me, why is that? And I just said racism, pure and, pure and simple. And they were like, well, what, what do you mean by that? Well, clearly in 185 years, there's probably been a black person who has been qualified to give the Christmas lectures. And you can go and ask yourself, then ask me, go and ask yourself why you think that person's not been picked. And I would suggest it's because the way in which we've gone and looked for the people to give the lectures, the networks which have been utilized to go and find the people to give those lectures, stop before you get to black people because they are a long way down those networks they are um you know it, they're, they're not in the uk maybe they've not been educated here they, they they don't look right you know there's lots of things which have presumably um led to to that dearth of black people in in, in like a couple of hundred years so yeah i i i I absolutely think and the media is responsible for bits of that, but I think academia is doing kind of a good job of harming itself before we start pointing the finger at the media. We have time probably for two more questions, so I'll get into that very quickly. So this is from Anonymous. Um, there's fairly good diversity at undergraduate levels and moderate at postgrad levels. What do you think is stopping this diversity continuing into the professional academic field yeah i think there's a there's a number of different things because as you you know the, the financial exposure if you will as you go through that system to pay for an msc or to pay for a phd or to you know it becomes more and more so if you're from a financially underprivileged background it becomes harder to stay in that system so one of it one of those things is you know just the cost of being educated is is difficult and the and the relatively small amount of scholarships focused towards those groups mean that they're hyper competitive. So there's just not enough to go around. So I think that's one part of the, the challenge there. And um, I think another part of the challenge again is like probably straight up racism. And, um, and you know, I, I talked about and written a few pieces with friends about PhD selection criteria and how we're measuring not ability and potential we are typically measuring historical access to opportunity have you written a paper for example seems like an innocent enough question on a phd application form to get 10 marks for if you have but ask yourself why a black person may not have had the opportunity to write a paper during the summer doing unfunded research in an institution right they may be intellectually just as strong as the candidate who did but they just didn't have access to that particular opportunity so just even going back to the previous question i had we had like even thinking a bit more about those sorts of things i think is it would be really really powerful to 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 help us tackle these issues thank you and the final question from claire who says i'm a young female senior lecturer and i get mistaken for a student all the time so I can't imagine how frustrating it must be to be a professor and be mistaken for the cleaner. Do you, and here's the question, do you have examples of times colleagues or friends were good allies when someone was racist? And second question, how can we be better allies? Yeah, I definitely have. So um, 
you know, very low level things. Like last night I was on a call and, and somebody, you know, this doesn't, yeah. So they, it had Dr. Chris Jackson on there. And the person who was on the call was like, oh, it's Professor Chris Jackson. I was like, oh, no, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And they were making a real point and kind of make, you know, they made a valid point. It's like, well, there's not many black professors and there's a load of people on this call. And I think it's really important that, and I think that allyship seems quite low level, but I think, you know, because I was a bit like, oh, it's a bit embarrassing to, to talk about it. But, but it, was, it was nice to see that. In terms of a more significant contribution and something which, um, you know, going back to the question, what somebody could do is, you know, when we had incidents of, of racial discrimination and microaggressions in, in our department this summer, um, there was a, a, a not insubstantial amount of people who, and, and, and four people in particular, who wrote a very, very powerful open letter to our head of department about the issues and why it was incorrect, what had happened, and, and it wasn't, that the head of the department had done something just to clarify, but some other incidents had happened. And that was just like overwhelming the support that those people who were all white and, you know, financially privileged white people, they were like, this is incorrect. This is how we're gonna show our allyship. And they followed that through as well since the summer, since early this year. So um, I think, you know, again, going to the question, like being aware of, the, of those incidents and they're hard conversations, right? writing an email, an open letter to your head of department is hard. Saying to your mum or dad or grandma, you know, that comment you made about that person in the shop is, is out of order. You know, like those, those are hard conversations, but this is a thing I've hopefully impressed upon you through this whole conversation is, if we're gonna make any progress, I think it's those hard conversations and those hard decisions. We're not gonna get this easy. It's like trying to get fit by wearing a pair of like, certain you know trainers or taking a magic pill some of those things like you know you, you're gonna have to do a little bit more uncomfortable work to to get what to where we need to be thank you and i'm, I'm going to end um, with a with a comment not a question from nijma who says thank you for an insightful discussion so chris thank you for the time you've spent with us thank you for your candor thank you for your wisdom and Thank you for answering the questions, which no is more than you can say to a lot of people who answer questions. <laughs> right. No, thank you. So it's a, yeah, it's a huge honour to be asked to come and do these sorts of things. Like I say, I'm a geologist and I am learning a huge amount by um, my experiences day on day after day. Taking part in these panels, as you can see, when I'm talking, I'm thinking about things as I'm going through them because they are not fully formed and they are not static thoughts either. They are evolving and they are informed by these sorts of interactions. And I think, you know, I think that's something we all need to kind of take away from these sorts of events is that this is a very dynamic, complicated problem, but we should be up for it, right? Because we're scientists dealing with dynamic hard problems all the time. Absolutely. So, so thank you for making us think and good night, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you.